Hello, my name is uh, Matthew and I am the China Specialist at Peter Harrington Books. And today I'm going to talk to you about three items from our China collections that show the sweep of Chinese propaganda from the 1950s through to the 1970s. Successive Chinese governments in the 20th century used propaganda like many modern states in order to uh, strengthen their political positions. Uh, and their control uh, over those who they ruled. And uh, Mao's China was certainly no exception. And indeed, they were very, very uh, skilled. The first book I'm going to show today is a really monumental item. This is a photo book produced in 1959 to celebrate 10 years of communist rule in China. Now, remember the context of the 1950s that Mao and other communist leaders had lived under the cloud of this threat of American uh, assistance being rendered to uh, the exiled nationalists on Taiwan. Uh, and although that didn't come to pass, to get to 10 years uh, of communist rule in China was an achievement that they rightly wanted to celebrate. And they had very lavish, uh, a very lavish celebration party effectively in Beijing in late September, ahead of National Day, which is 1st of October uh, in China. They invited a lot of foreign dignitaries and of course, lots of domestic VIPs. And this book was uh, produced shortly after those celebrations to, uh, as a gift to, uh, to give to foreign VIPs. It's in English, uh, as you'll uh, see when I turn inside and as you'll see from the title on the spine, uh, and it's, uh, as all photo books are, it's very, very lavish. You'll see actually, if I show you again, the very ornate tooling on the spine um, and this large uh, gilt and red emblem of the People's Republic of China uh, on the front. Turning inside, the high production quality really uh, continues. See the title page there. As expected, you have a picture of Mao uh, at the front, uh, which was standard in this kind of political text at the time and almost foreshadows the Cultural Revolution and the cult of his personality. And then feature that I particularly like is this picture of a lesser known figure uh, on the world stage, Liu Xiaoqi, who was head of state at this time and who Mao would dispense with in the Cultural Revolution uh, a few years later. Liu was very important, so he merited this kind of equal uh, treatment now the book, as I said, is very, very lavishly uh, produced. What do we have? Let me turn to one of these uh, pages. So it shows you some of the key speeches by dignitaries, uh, such as Premier Zhou Enlai, who is a, a big figure on the international stage. And of course, a speech by Comrade Khrushchev, uh, Khrushchev, the head of uh, uh, Soviet Union uh, at the time. And then there's lots of uh, pictures uh, of various celebrations. And if I prize this one open here very nicely, it extends quite far, but you can see just by doing that, this is a, a kind of panorama of, uh, of Tiananmen Square, of the celebrations, lots of balloons. You'll see uh, in the background there, the Great Hall of the People, one of a series of architectural projects built to again, celebrate this landmark 10 years of communism. And uh, one other very nice photograph, Again, uh, folding, quite large, uh, but you'll see is, uh, uh, shows the Tiananmen rostrum, the uh, part of China, uh, sorry, the part of uh, the Tiananmen complex where leaders will review uh, march paths uh, down uh, the Chang'an Avenue. And you'll see on there Mao in the center with Khrushchev, the kind of two leaders of the communist camp, various other important dignitaries, there's Liu Xiaoqi, uh, there's Deng Xiaoping, uh, of course, later to be known as the kind of reformer, economic reformer of China. This is a very big uh, occasion. But what I like about this book, and of course not stated in such a work of propaganda, is the some of the subtext. So you'll see from this picture, uh, a picture of Mao uh, and Khrushchev together uh, on the evenings before uh, the 1st of October National Day Parade. There was a big banquet in the Great Hall of the People and of course, this photo book wants to show uh, the fraternal uh, brotherhood amongst, uh, uh, between uh, Beijing and Moscow, uh, a sense of unity in the face of American uh, capitalist-led imperialism. 
But I like this picture because Mao and Khrushchev look a little bit, bit awkward and what this picture almost brings out, the camera never lies, right, is actually at this time, China and the Soviet Union were beginning to drift apart. There were secret conversations held while Khrushchev was in China between Khrushchev and Mao and other uh, senior figures from both sides, uh, violently disagreeing um, over uh, the nature of foreign policy. Khrushchev was trying to reach out to the United States at this time, had been to see Eisenhower. Mao fundamentally disagreed with this approach. And in the next few years, the Sino-Soviet split would happen where these two camps went from being uh, sworn friends to sworn enemies and would exchange barbs uh, in state media for much of the 1960s and 1970s. So this is a really a monument to the height of Sino-Soviet cooperation and uh, kind of foreshadowing a little bit its uh, decline. So that's the first, the first one. So moving on to the 1960s, it's all about this, the Little Red Book, uh, one of the most well-known cultural symbols, I think, from that time in the world, referenced by, by uh, so many uh, musicians and uh, everybody, everybody knows it. Now, at Peter Harrington, we have several of the really rare Chinese first editions, but I wanted to talk to you today about the Little Red Book's uh, foreign face uh, because there were, well, in stock, we have a collection of 25 translations of the Little Red Book into, I should say, into 25 foreign languages, really capturing the sense in which they wanted to spread the gospel of Maoism uh, far and wide. And not just in Romance languages, but of course, Beijing support for uh, decolonization movements around the world and for parts of the world where they could contest uh, American and Soviet Union influence necessitated a large number of very interesting translations. So this is one done in Swahili here. Here we have one uh, done in Arabic. And then finally, we have one uh, which is done in Mongolian uh, uh, as well. And so these translations are very interesting. They, they show us the kind of universal aesthetic that was aimed for uh, around the world and why it became such a readily identifiable object. There's a couple of other nice little things that you can tease out here. First of all, is this edition, which is the only bilingual edition of the Little Red Book produced, which is a Chinese-English edition, much thicker, as you can see. And I like this one because the publisher uh, is listed as what's called in Chinese Dong Fan Hong Chu Ran Shu, which means the East is Red Press. And the East of Red Press was actually the Cultural Revolution reincarnation of the commercial press, one of the big names in Chinese publishing. But as a sign of the times when the Cultural Revolution started, a lot of the old guard of commercial press were effectively slung out of office for their, their links to various forms of outdated uh, cultural ideologies, supposedly. And uh, the, the press took a real kind of radical turn and had to change its name. This is pretty much all they could do, other than translating a few other things. This was their main project. And so this is a very nice item as well. And then finally, we come to this one, which is an edition in Hindi from 1972. This one's interesting because let's compare with, say, uh, our uh, edition here. This is the Swahili one. And you'll see, and I can just show it here. You'll see it has this lovely calligraphic preface at the front. Uh, scripted or brushed by Mao's number two, Lin Biao, who was his closest comrade in arms, is how he was called in the press, and he really promoted the Mao cult. Fast forward to 1972, Lin has, uh, has had a bit of a bad way because he, uh, Mao has become distrustful of his rising power. Lin has become very wary because Mao tends to hold a grudge, and Lin ends up fleeing to the Soviet Union, that old uh, now enemy of China, um, and his plane crashes on the way. He's recast as a traitor. And so, of course, suddenly all of these editions become very embarrassing because they have Lin Biao's preface when, in fact, state media is now telling people that Lin Biao has always been opposing Chairman Mao's revolutionary line. So what to do? They have to usher to press, excuse me, usher to press uh, a lot of um, new editions. And you see this Hindi one. Here we have the picture of Mao, still required in every book. Uh, every copy, and then straight into what is the uh, table of contents. Lin Biao has vanished, 
uh, and uh, that basically symbolizes his disgrace. So there's the Little Red Book there. We have a wonderful collection of those. And then finally, let's go to the 1970s. We have the 60s and the 50s with the photo book. And we have this one, which is called uh, The Words and Deeds of the Gang of Four. So Mao dies in 1976. That's the end of the Cultural Revolution, really. And then the blame game begins. Who do we put the responsibility for these 10 grueling years of quite horrific uh, political movements on? And essentially, uh, an up and coming uh, leader named Hua Guofeng takes power with uh, some allies in the military. And they pin all the blame on Jan Qing, which is Mao's widow, and a group of other three other uh, political leaders. And they're called the Gang of Four. They're christened the Gang of Four very quickly by the press. And so this book, published in Hong Kong by a Beijing backed publisher in 1977, anthologizes the criticisms being leveled at the Gang of Four as part of this, this push to make sure that uh, the uh, the kind of party line being put out in Beijing is also reflected uh, in Hong Kong as well amongst um, or in the kind of propaganda uh, environment uh, there. And so there's several, I mean, there's so many wonderful cartoons in here in particular. These, uh, I really like, these show Jan Xing, who um, in the kind of 20th century reincarnation of the evil woman trope of history is very much seen as the number one target for uh, cartoonists. And this is pointing to her uh, kind of hedonism. When she was younger, she worked as an actress in Shanghai. This was kind of dredged up, this fact, and she was made to be very vain, uh, all about kind of very uncommunist kind of consumption. High heels feature a big way in this thing. Um, so this is very much kind of character assassination on uh, Jan Xing. What else do we have? Let me fast forward to uh, another. Um, this one here, showing the four members of the Gang of Four. Uh, well, one of them is still managing to balance on this precarious tower of chairs, which is linked together by such labels as uh, fake revolution and uh, usurping the party and taking power. So a kind of uh, a visual metaphor for uh, their political strategy. You see the other three, as I showed there, have already started to fall down. This is the edifice of their power crumbling down, a very compelling visual image and one that the state was anxious to promote. And then a final one, if I can just find it here. I like this one too. You'll see on the right hand side as you look at it. This shows Wang Hongwen, one of this group of four, the youngest, and this is uh, pulling on an allegation that he had had official portraits taken in preparation for taking power so that his his face would be at the front of the next photo book and things like this. Um, and you see him here, he's kind of sizing himself up for the frame. To uh, In the centre there, you have a picture of someone who's meant to be Liu Xiaoqi, who by now, by this point, has, uh, uh, his power uh, it's truly gone because of the Cultural Revolution, he's, he's died, and he's still very much persona non grata. And then at the left, and that's who I, I take to be Winston Churchill, um, and the caption at the bottom is fairly pithy. It says, uh, from left to right, it says, foreign scoundrel, old scoundrel, new scoundrel. Churchill was a foreign scoundrel. Liu Xiaoqi was the old scoundrel, and Wang Hao Wang was the, the new scoundrel. So three works of fascinating works of Chinese propaganda there from our collections, and we have a lot more on the website, which I invite you to explore. Thank you for watching.